Hey guys, so as promised, today we're going to be talking about good works in the life of the believer. I want to try and answer that question that I've heard um, here recently. Now that I'm saved, now what? I have believed, now what? What is it that God wants from me now that I am his child? What are these good works? Where do they fit in in the life of the believer? And what are the type of good works that God desires from his children? Guys, I want you to understand that everything that I do on this channel, I do for one reason, because I love God and I love my brothers and sisters dearly. I know that you probably won't understand this unless you have a ministry or you have an online ministry or YouTube of your own, but from the moment that I wake up to the moment that I go to bed, the majority of my time is spent addressing this channel and my brothers and sisters on this channel. Um, from the moments that I'm pouring through the comments as they come in, addressing the concerns and questions of my brothers and sisters, making sure I'm showing everyone attention, answering their questions and concerns, um, debating uh, false doctrine and contending for the gospel message, studying and preparing for new videos, uh, making sure that I'm listening to that still small voice uh, for what the next thing I'm gonna be talking about is. And as many of you can attest, I freely give out my contact information, my phone number, my email address, my physical address. Some of you have been to my house. Um, I offer myself to you 24-7, um, day and night. I'm always daily on the phone with brothers and sisters addressing questions, concerns, um, uh, responding to prayer requests for various tragedies, surgeries, things that are going on in, in your lives, financial troubles, people that are needing some financial help, needing money, things like that. I spend from the moment that I wake up to the moment I go to bed, the majority of my time um, with my brothers and sisters on this channel. I have canceled plans with family, friends. I place you guys before everything on this channel. And I'm not making a red cent. I don't monetize this channel. I don't have a Patreon. I'm not making a dime for this channel. I'm not getting famous. I'm a nobody. Everything I do on this channel is for one reason alone. Because I love my king and I love my brothers and sisters. And there are many of you on this channel who have been with me for a while that can attest that everything that I'm saying is true. I don't talk about this very much because I don't boast. But make, but rest assured, make no mistake, those of you who would accuse me of being against good works or not encouraging good works or not teaching on good works, I do good works every single day. I just don't talk about it. And I'm certainly not trusting in it. That's the difference. But everything that I do on this channel is because I love you and because I love my king, our king, and for no other reason. Um, and I say that and I bring this up only because of the accusation that comes out against me and people like me who are doing the same thing, that we are against good works or we're not for good works. That's malarkey. I do good works every single day. I just don't talk about it very much. I keep it between me and God as it's supposed to be. Because um, I'm not doing it for any other reason than because I love him and I love you. Um, and so with that said, I want to talk about the type of good works that God desires. Because guys, unbelievers do good works all the time. You think God is honoring those good works? Uh, when I got my motorcycle, I was looking into motorcycle clubs. And I found out that the Hell's Angels, the motorcycle gang, which is involved in all manner of organized crime that they're well known throughout their communities of giving huge sums of their income to charity. They're well known for charitable acts throughout their community. And yet they're involved in all kinds of organized crime. And most of them are not believers in Jesus Christ. So um, I say this so that you'll understand that, that unbelievers do good works all the time. God is not honoring their filthy, right, their filthy rags righteousness. Um, and so there's a type of good works that God desires. And so I want to read to you from Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, 
Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. All right. Notice here that this passage says that it's the grace of God, that it's the work of Jesus Christ that motivates us to live godly lives and become zealous for good works. I want you to imagine for a moment that you have a proverbial gun to your head. Somebody in your life has a gun to your head and they say, if you don't love me, I'm gonna pull the trigger. If you don't go out and clean the house and do the dishes and go grocery shopping and shine my boots, change the oil in my car, and if you don't do all of these things, I'm gonna pull the trigger and blow your head off. The works that you're doing for that individual, are you doing it because you love them? Or are you doing it because you're afraid that if you don't, they're gonna pull the trigger and kill you? Do you think that God desires those kinds of good works? Good works that are built in and based in fear and terror. Do you think that the individual who is doing that for the person with the gun to their head is doing those things because they love that person or because they're terrified that if they don't, that that person's going to kill them? Do you think those are works of love, works that come from the heart? Do you th think that those kind of tainted, filthy works are the kind of works that God desires from his children. Guys, Romans chapter eight says that we've been given not a spirit of fear that goes back into slavery and bondage, but a spirit that cries out, Abba, Father. That Abba word, it's essentially in English, daddy. It's a, it's a intimate father. It's not just dad. It's, it's like, it's what a little child says to their dad, daddy. It's the, that's the equivalent of Abba. It's not just father. It's not just dad. It's this intimate word for dad. That's, it's essentially daddy in the English language, my daddy. Um, and that's the spirit that we've been given. We've not been given a spirit of bondage and fear where, we're, where our obedience is coming from a place of fear. We've been given a spirit of freedom. We have been brought and adopted into the family of God. And so now the good works that we do, we're not doing these good works because he's got a gun to our head, because God has removed the gun from our head. The gun on our head, it's the law of Moses. The law that says, do these things and you shall live. Do these things not and you shall die. God has removed the sting of the law, the sting of death. The, the law of condemnation and death. He's removed the proverbial gun from our head. And now we're no longer under condemnation. We no longer obey from a place of fear and obligation, but from a place of sonship, from a place of freedom, from a place of rest. The kind of works that we do now, we do not because we're afraid that if we don't, God is going to cast us into the eternal fire. Because those kind of good works are not good works based in love. That's tyranny. Those are good works and obedience based on fear. That's not the relationship we have with God in the new covenant. The only way that God can produce a people, as this passage says, that are zealous for good works is to remove the source of fear. Remove the law. This is what Paul means when he says we must die to the law to be married to another. As long as you have that gun to your head, you never know from one day to the next if the obedience that you have is you trying to obey because if you feel because you feel that if you don't, God is going to cast you into eternal fire. That's obedience from a fear. That's tyranny. And the person who does that is a tyrant. God is not a tyrant. God sent his only son. He became flesh, lived a perfect life, and took all the penalty of your sin upon himself so that you may be made the righteousness of God in him. God is not a tyrant. God loves you. He wants you as his child, as his son, as his daughter. And the only way that he can do that and produce, as this passage says, a people set apart for himself, zealous for good works, 
is for him to remove entirely that gun from your head, which is the law. And those of you out there who think, as the comment uh, that I read in my last video, that we're striving to enter the kingdom by our obedience, and if we don't strive enough or we fail to keep the laws or be obedient enough, we're going to be cast into fire. These people don't get it because they don't understand the heart of God. They don't know him. They're still slaving under the old covenant system. Christ doesn't know these people. They don't know him. The kind of obedience that God desires from his children is an obedience that comes from a place of freedom. You are free from the law of sin and death. You have been given a spirit that says, Abba, Abba, Father, Daddy. You're not under condemnation anymore. So you are free to obey him from a place of love and a place of rest and a place of peace. Those are the kind of good works that God desires from you. Those works of the law, those works that you're doing slaving under the law, that's filthy to God. That's filthy. He doesn't want works based in terror and fear. He's not a tyrant. That person doesn't know God. This is what John means in 1 John when he says, the one who, has, who fears is not made perfect in love. For perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. He's saying that person doesn't know God. This person doesn't understand the heart of God. Under the new covenant, there is no condemnation for the believer. We've been adopted as children. We're not in, we've not been given a spirit of fear and bondage. The one who's slaving and striving to enter the kingdom by some other way, rather than recognizing that God did everything required, that person doesn't know him. They haven't come to the end of themselves. They're obeying from a place of fear, no different than the dead Pharisee. They were trying to be obedient to the law too. And Christ calls them dead, dead men's bones. That's not the way. The kind of obedience that God wants from you comes from here. And the only way that you can understand this is you must die to the law. You must have the gun from your head removed. You must be made free. Your chains must be broken. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to free you. Now, Paul says, don't, don't use your freedom as an occasion to sin. Don't use your freedom to let sin reign in the mortal body. Of course not. But why would we want to? And this is what, this is the crux of what I want you to understand. When you believe, when you received Christ, he didn't just leave you as, a, as, a, as an orphan, abandoned as a bastard. He lives in you. He gave you his spirit to guide you. you, are, you have, your spirit has been born again, new. Yes, you still walk around in fallen flesh, and that fallen flesh still has all of its old desires, but there's something new inside of you. And that's his spirit, the new creation. And that spirit doesn't want to live in sin. That spirit hates sin. You can sin and God will not revoke your salvation, but you're going to be miserable doing it because sin no longer has the same appetite that it did before. You still sin. I still sin. We all still fall short. But the new creation in, in you is never going to be happy in sin. It hates it. it the, the spirit resists the flesh. Why would we want to live in sin? This is what Paul means in Romans 6. Why, how would we who have died to sin, how could we live any longer in it? I don't want to live in sin. I don't want to go back to dancing on stripper poles and being in gay pride parades and all of the other debauchery that I used to live in before I knew God. I don't want to go back to any of that. I hate those things. Does that mean that I no longer sin? Does that mean I don't lose my temper? That I don't cuss when I'm mad sometimes? That I don't, that I, I love perfectly? That I forgive perfectly? No, I'm not even close to perfect. 
My flesh is still sinful. But I have a new man inside of me that hates those things. And so this whole notion that God's grace is a license to sin, this person doesn't understand what we've been given. He doesn't understand. The person that says this doesn't understand. They're still of the carnal mind. Those of us in Christ who have received the true gospel, that truly have come to understand what Christ did for us, we're the ones who truly repented, had the change of mind. Because God's grace, his mercy through the finished work of Christ is what changes minds and changes hearts. It's the grace of God that teaches men to deny ungodliness. The law can never do this. I want to read to you a few more passages. Let's talk about why we do good works. Do we do good works because if we don't, God's going to revoke our salvation? No, because our salvation was never based on works. Our salvation was based on the finished work of Christ. It was never something we earn or merit. We're not under Leviticus. We're not under the old covenant system. We're under the new covenant. Grace, unmerited. So no, our works do not secure us a place in heaven, nor do they prevent us from getting in. So why do we do good works? Well, let's listen to what Paul has to say in the book of Titus. Titus chapter 3, verse 8. This saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. Why? Well, he says in the next verse, these things are excellent and profitable for people. Do you understand that as a child of God, you're an ambassador of Christ? The world is looking at you. You are the light of the world. When they look at you, they should want to say, I want what that person has. You want them to see Christ in you. If you're living like them, if you're living, if you're living like the heathen, are they going to see Christ in you? No. And so your testimony is a huge reason why we should do good works. But you know what really turns off the unbeliever? A self-righteous hypocrite. A self-righteous zealot. Do you want to know why the world is so, a large portion of the world is so resistant to Christianity? Because in many ways, we have failed as ambassadors of Christ. We are so busy being like Jonah. And if you remember in the story of Jonah, Jonah did not want to go and tell Nineveh to repent. He hated Nineveh. He hated the Ninevites. He didn't want them to repent. He wanted them to come under judgment. He was trying to sail in the opposite direction. The last thing he wanted to do was show Nineveh grace. And that's exactly what many of us as ambassadors of Christ have done. Instead of going out into the darkness and shining the light, going to that LGBTQ whatever parade, and telling them what Christ did for them, showing them the love of God, the mercy of God, we're so busy casting stones because the truth is many of us don't want those people to be saved. Many of us in the foolishness of our minds think deep down in our hearts that we're more deserving of God's grace and mercy than they are. Those wicked homosexuals, they don't deserve the grace of God. I hope they perish, I hope they burn. Now, some people will say that. Some people won't say it, but they're thinking it. Either way, it's wrong and it's against the heart of God. Jesus Christ had an entourage of prostitutes, whores, tax collectors, and other depraved people who fell so in love with Jesus and the message that he preached that it changed their heart, it changed their mind, and it changed their very being. Pharisees hated it. They hated that his entourage was an entourage of sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes and harlots. They hated it. And their self-righteous zeal for the law, those rotten sinners, they don't deserve the grace of God. Look at this man. He's a friend of the whore and the harlot and the tax collector. They don't deserve mercy. But was that the message of Jesus to those people? He had an entourage of sinners, harlots, whores, and prostitutes because they fell in love with him. He offered them mercy. He offered them grace. He offered them forgiveness, and it changed them. Just like it did Saul of Tarsus, who was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. 
when he came to understand the grace and mercy of God, it radically transformed him, changed who he was. He even changed his name. That's something only the grace of God can do, only the mercy of God, only the true gospel can do. You want to know why there are so many people who are resisting the church, who are being pushed further and further away from the church? Many of, the, many, many of the times it's because of those who come in the name of Christ. And those very people don't even know Christ. They don't know his message. They don't have his mercy. They don't have his grace. They don't have the fruits of the spirit. And people see it and they're like, I don't want any of that. If that's Christianity, I don't want none of that. Mm -mm. Perfect example is Kat Von D. I don't know if any of you know who Kat Von D is. Kat Von D wa was a, uh, well, I don't know if she still is, but she was a tattooist, a tattoo artist. And she was involved in the occult. She was famous. She had her own show on television. Um, but she did tattoo art, art, artistry. And she was involved in the occult and witchcraft. And she used dark makeup and all that whole nine yards. Well, she recently came to Christ. Radically just came to Christ. Like a radical moment in time where she came to Christ. Believed on him. Put her trust in him. And she's a safe sister. Um, and she came under so much condemnation from people who call themselves Christians. And the nasty comments that people were saying to her because she still had dark hair and she still her wardrobe was still a little dark. She's a baby Christian. She just came to Christ, okay? And because she didn't fit a certain mold, the Christian community had nothing but terrible things to say to her. And it was so bad that she went on to a talk show with another Christian to talk about it that her husband, who's still an unbeliever, who was being tempted to come to the faith, saw all the hatred that supposed Christians were throwing her way. He literally said to her, if that's Christianity, I want no part. And I say this to you because those who call themselves Christians are num the number one stumbling block to people coming to Christ. We're so self-righteous. We're so deluded in our minds that we somehow think we're more deserving of other people. For the grace and mercy of God. And I'm going to give you a staunch warning, those of you out there who are this person, who have fooled yourselves into thinking that you represent Christ. Jesus tells a parable. It's a scary parable of the unmerciful servant, the servant who God was, was ready to pardon of everything that he owed. He had a debt that was so great that he had to sell his whole family and everything he owned to get out from under it. And the king forgave him of all of his debt freely that same servant went out and his servant owed him just a portion of the debt and that servant held him to the full account of the law and God had some words to say for that wicked servant you think that you're going to receive the grace of God for you and that God's going to show you pardon and then you're going to hold everyone else to the full account of the law you've got another thing coming that person, the point of this story, the point of this, the point of this parable is that person is not Christ's. That person is a tear. They don't understand the gospel. They don't believe the gospel. The person that has the mentality, grace for me, but not for you. I'm more worthy of God's grace than that wicked whoever named the sin. That person doesn't understand the gospel and that person's in deep, deep trouble. Which brings me to another point. I've had some accusations thrown at me that I'm being unloving because I'm calling out false doctrine and I'm calling it out plainly. And I'm warning people that false doctrine and false gospels cannot save. I'm being accused of being unloving because of what I'm doing on my channel. I can think of nothing more unloving than seeing people walking towards a cliff unawares and saying nothing. Somehow I'm being unloving because I'm warning people about false doctrine and false gospel messages. And I'm being told that what I should do is just shut my mouth and let them walk right off the cliff. Somehow that's more loving than me being, than me calling out false doctrine that's going to send people to hell. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're a sheep and a flock of sheep and all of the other sheep are busy grazing, but you notice off in the distance that there's a wolf prowling and the other sheep don't seem to notice. And they're slowly grazing and moving more and more in the direction of the wolf and they don't know it. 
Is it loving for that sheep to not warn his fellow sheep and just let them go off and be devoured by the wolf? Is that loving to just be silent and say nothing? It's the most unloving thing that he could do is to say nothing and not warn them. Well, I'm going to continue to warn people. And you can call it harsh. You can believe that it's harsh because I'm saying that a false gospel cannot save. But I want to repeat to you the words of Paul. If anyone comes to you preaching a gospel than that which you have heard from us, if even an angel from heaven preaches to you a gospel other than what you have heard from us, let them be accursed. Anathema. Let them be under God's curse. You might call Paul's words unloving there, but he is very serious about his flock. He loves his brothers and sisters, and he will stop at nothing to protect them from the wolves. And that's what I'm doing when I warn you on this channel. I do it because I love you, because I know we have an enemy, an adversary out there who is seeking to whom he may devour. And his only goal is to kill, steal, and destroy. And he wears the guise of the sheep. He wears the guise as the minister of righteousness. He wears the guise as the angel of light, but he's not. And so I am warning my brothers and sisters, and I am calling a spade a spade. If you think that's unloving, you're not reading the same Bible that I am. Scripture is clear. We are to call out false doctrine and protect our brothers and sisters. We're to rightly divide scriptures, contend for the gospel. It's not unloving to do so. I'm going to read to you another passage. Those of you who are wondering, okay, so we're under grace. Now what do I do? Why, why, why would I do good works if I don't have to to be saved? Romans 11, verse 21. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, on account of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Notice he, that he says that the reason for them to do this is because of God's mercy, on account of God's mercy. God has shown you mercy through the gospel, through the finished work of Christ. So as your reasonable service, as your worship to him, offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's the role of good, good works in the life of the believer. Not because you have to. Not because if you don't, you're going to lose the free gift of salvation. But because of what God did for you, offer up your bodies as a, as a reasonable sacrifice. That passage in Peter that says, be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. Why does it say that you should be holy as your Father in heaven is holy? Because you were not bought with perishable things. You were not bought, it was not cheap for God. The blood of Christ is precious and it was shed on the cross for you. So on account of God's mercy, offer up your body as a living sacrifice to him. Walk uprightly. Walk in godliness as your reasonable service because it's good and profitable among men because it's only glorifying your Father in heaven. You glorify him through your good works. That's what Paul says is the reasoning for good works in the life of the believer. It's not because you're earning your salvation. It's not because you're keeping your salvation because each and every good work that you do and you say nothing about, you keep it to yourself you glorify your father. Let unbelievers see your good works and you say nothing. Don't brag about it. Don't say, this is what makes me right. Look how holy I am. Say nothing. Do good and say nothing and you will glorify your father in heaven. You know what I find about uh, amongst all of these people who, who are so confident in their own righteousness? They can't stop talking about all the good works they do. They can't stop talking about good works. You know why? Because they're trusting in their good works to make them right before God. Be quiet. Do good works because you should, not because you have to, and shut up about it. Stop talking about it. Because the people that are doing good works for God, they're not talking about it. They're not boasting about it. They're not standing on the street corner shouting out about all the great good things they've done. That person is trusting in their own righteousness. Do you ever notice that about these people? These people that have the false gospel message, the tares, they can't stop talking about good works and the importance of their own good works and all the good works they're doing. 
The person that's really doing the good works that God desires, they're doing it and they're shutting up. They're not talking about it all the time because it's between them and God. The other people have their reward. The people that are really doing the good works that God desires ain't talking about it. Shut up. Stop talking about it. Just do it. Do it and don't talk about it. All right? Now, I want to end with this passage because this is a passage that's very important. The first thing that we need to do before we can ever even think about doing good works unto God, doing the kind of good works that please God, is we need to come to, our, come to the end of ourselves. We need to realize that there is nothing that I can do to make myself right with God. If I ever want to come to the place where I have a change of heart, true repentance, metanoia, I need to first come to the end of myself and realize there's nothing I can do to make myself right with God and receive the free gift. And I want to read to you a passage that talks about this. A passage that a lot of people don't talk about. It's found in Matthew 11, 11. And oh boy, do I love that number, 11, 11. I love you too, Lord. It says, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Why do I bring this passage up? Why is this passage important? John the Baptist lived a mon uh, uh, he he lived the life as a monk. Okay, he ate only locusts and honey. He kept every jot and tittle of the law. This is a man who ate, ate, drank, and breathed the law. All right, he lived as a monk. And Jesus says that this man is the most righteous man who's ever been born of a woman's womb, obviously not including himself. But other than Jesus, this is the most righteous man who has ever been born from a woman's womb. This is a man who lived a life as a monk. He lived out in the wilderness. He wore sackcloth. He only ate locusts and honey. He made sure he kept every jot and tittle of the law. Why is this important? Because Jesus says that although this man is the greatest man that's ever been born of the, uh, from a woman's womb, that even the least of us who have entered the kingdom of heaven will be greater than he. Why? Because even the least of us has received the righteousness of Christ. And the point of this story is even the man who Jesus says was the greatest among men, according to the law, he kept every jot and tittle of the law. He ate locusts and honey. He lived in the wilderness, had, did everything possible to keep every aspect of the law. And yet even that man, the least of us who have received the righteousness of Christ, will be greater than he. You understand what Jesus is trying to say here? You must receive the righteousness of God, not the righteousness that comes by the law. John the Baptist, on his own, apart from Christ, wouldn't have been good enough to get into the kingdom. Do you understand that's what he's saying? Because he says, the least in the kingdom are better than John the Baptist. If John the Baptist isn't even as good as the least in the kingdom, John the Baptist ain't getting in apart from the righteousness of Christ. Do you understand the importance of this passage? The least in the kingdom of God is better than John the Baptist. Those of you out there who don't think that Jesus is teaching salvation by grace. You got to understand, guys, that Jesus's message intentionally was kept a mystery. Jesus, you ever wonder why Jesus alludes to the gospel, but he doesn't always speak it plainly? The reason is what Paul says in Corinthians, that the mystery of the gospel wasn't fully revealed until after the crucifixion. Jesus kept it a mystery. That's why it was a mystery found in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. You can see Jesus in the gospel in all of the books of the Old Testament, but they're shrouded. It's shrouded in mystery. It's there, but you got to look for it. It's shrouded in mystery. It wasn't revealed fully in its fullness until the Apostle Paul after the crucifixion. And that's important for us to understand. And it's passages like this that at first seemed cryptic, where Jesus was speaking the gospel message before his crucifixion. Um, and so I wanted you to, I wanted to end this video on that because it's a passage that's very powerful and it's been on my heart. And it has the number 1111, which is a special number between me and God. But anyway, I hope this blessed you. I hope this got you to understand the kind of good works that God desires in your life. Um, 
Let me know in the comment section what you thought. I love you.